Welcome to another episode of When Life Hands You Lenins, the podcast where Lenin hands you music industry advice and you apply it to your professional career. In this episode, I sit down with Matt Lillywhite, a fellow writer at EDM.com, artist manager for Anecdote, and music industry marketing professional. Matt discusses how his journey within the music industry has landed him the incredible jobs that he's had, as well as his unique and results-driven campaigns and tactics to grow an artist in today's digital music industry. Matt has been an admirable professional within the music industry for years now. I met him online through writing at EDM.com about a year and a half ago. Ever since, I've envied his transparency for his tactics within the music industry, as well as his unprecedented marketing efforts and creative feats. Please enjoy this episode with music industry marketing guru, Matt Lillywhite. I'm with Matt Lillywhite. He's uh, traveling the United States, and thankfully he had to make a pit stop through Orlando here. And uh, One of my favorite places in the world, so really? why not? Yeah, well, you got all the theme parks here, so. <laughs> so we made a pit stop, and we, we've had lunch earlier this week, and we chatted, and um, now we actually sat down, and we're recording something. So I mm-hmm. hope you enjoy this episode. We're just going to talk a little bit about uh, the music industry and all that fun stuff. So Matt, why don't you why don't we kick off and kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what yeah, you've done? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Matt Lillywhite. I am 19 years old and I am considered to be almost one of the most influential people of my age within the music industry. A lot of people tend to say that anyway, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, So I started off when I was age 16, I created a charity single for Cancer Research UK, it was called Beautiful. That track ended up getting about 150, 160,000 Spotify plays with the project in total. Uh, We got some remixes from the likes of Class, who is a platinum-selling German producer, Marvels, who are within the electronic scene, within their sort of niche, pretty well-known, and a couple of others uh, from like Sony and a couple of other places, so that was pretty awesome. Uh, One of the remixes ended up being played at Tomorrowland, which is one of the biggest EDM festivals, so that was pretty awesome. Um, Got supported by Dimitri Vegas and Like Mike, Rehab, Pete, Barzook, I think is how you say his name. Um, so yeah, that was really awesome. And then from that, I went on to work at the Wall of Comedy, which is a giant viral platform page, whatever you want to call it. At the time, it had about 2 million followers. Now it's on around 5 million. And basically, I was writing articles, doing interviews, just working with people and understanding the social media industry, as it were. I was learning to sort of understand the social media environment, how to get followers, how to get likes, boost engagement, that type of stuff. And when I moved to Australia, would it be in August 2017, I left the wall of comedy and I got pretty deep into the music industry. So I decided, right, I want the attention within the music industry, how do I do that? So I thought, well, media, that's a good place to start. So I hit up a couple of big media blogs, several got back to me, and I ended up getting a job at EDM.com, so that was pretty awesome. Um, Yeah, and then from then I started music management with an artist called Anecdote. We've ended up doing, within the two or three months we've been working together, we've done soundtracks for Amazon and Netflix, uh, we've got some great new music coming up. We're doing some really awesome things. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's. I mean, you're definitely. I can definitely agree to the you being one of the most influential people, especially for your age. It's kind of inspiring, actually, to see like, wow, I'm I'm only 22. So seeing somebody who's even three years younger who's doing way more than what I've ever done and thought about doing, and it sounds like you've kind of networked your way through the industry. So of all that stuff that you've kind of done, what do you say has been the most kind of pivotal in your career and what's something that you learned the most from and what was something that you had failed at and really, really learned from? I'd say that the most pivotal moment in my career was definitely when I started managing Anecdote. 
simply because it wasn't just my career within the music industry, it was someone else's. Like, I was held accountable to somebody else. And that really enforced my actions. It made me think harder. It made me want to actually pursue the career a lot more, not to only further my own career, but also to further his. As for failures, I've got to admit, my favourite one is definitely when I was managing a duo called Uplink in, I believe it was March 2017. They were my first ever act. I was totally new to the game at that point. Um, And we started doing some official remixes for people and I had no clue how to manage an artist at that point. Like, I was pretty clueless. And I think the sort of trial and error of doing some successful things and some absolute failures, I think that led to me being where I am right now. Definitely. And I mean, the music industry is is kind of about trial and error. It's it's constantly changing. There's not anything you can do. You can start a trend, but that's not going to mean the trend is going to be here in a month or a day even. So it's it's really a big trial and error industry. Totally agree. So Matt and I both write at EDM.com and Matt usually shares a lot of his music industry marketing tips and I try to steer more towards the news pieces and interviews and fun stuff like that. So um, you just wrote a piece about the top 15 ways to grow your fan base, correct? So kind of tell us a little bit about how to do that. Kind of break that article down a little bit for us. Okay, uh, so first of all, I'd like to start off by saying that I can't remember every single one off the top of my head. I don't expect (laughs) you to. (laughs) Um, But there's like a couple of things which you can do, like... At the end of the day, there's two things which will be a major factor, and that's talent. Um, If your music is no good, chances are it's not going to get anywhere. I'm just being blunt. Um, And also hard work, like what's your work ethic? Because if you can't be bothered to put in the work, then you can't expect to get anything back. Um, So first of all, a couple of things you can do is, I find it's controversial, but giving away your music for free to influencers, people with influence on social media, that's a great way to create distribution of your track. So for example, in, I believe it was July 2017, I collaborated with the Australian government twice. um, And we ended up creating a piece together, which was like a whale video that ended up getting over 10 million total YouTube, uh, Facebook views, sorry. And that was really good. And likewise, that track ended up getting 1.5 million Spotify streams because so many people were searching for it. So that was great. Um, But yeah, basically, when you give out your music to free for somebody, they'll often put the Spotify link in the description of their YouTube video. And so people, say if it's getting, I don't know, 500,000 views a video and you've got 50 influencers using your music, it's pretty obvious that you're going to get some traffic towards your song. And so that's one way which I absolutely love. Also, creating, looking at viral trends, understanding what's popular. So for example, you can go to the trending page on YouTube and notice, oh, Donald Trump's in the news. Maybe we make something around that. Um, but yeah things like that because at the end of the day if people are searching for it and your remix comes up they're going to listen to it and because it's a trending topic chances are they're going to share it and thus grow your view base grow your fan base grow your revenue from monetization there's so many opportunities Uh, also one thing I'm doing with my artist anecdote at the moment is collaborating with influencers Um, This was very strategic in the fact that they already have 500,000 followers, a million followers, whatever. And so by getting them as vocalists on the tracks, uh, they'll automatically be promoted to a large audience. They can do Spotify swipe ups and stuff from Instagram, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, whatever. And that'll just be great for distribution, quite honestly. It'll help us get more plays very, very quickly. It'll help us sort of with pitching towards Spotify, other curators, other platforms and stuff like that. So yeah, I just sort of think you've got to be really tactical about how you grow your fan base. And the article is available on edm.com if you want to read it. Definitely. And I'll put that uh, link to the article in the show notes and anything else that we talk about in the show notes of this, this podcast. One thing before I forget, one thing that you have been kind of that I've really admired about that you've taken a very tactical, very different approach is, is going after 
different social media influencers. Like that's not really the standard route. It's nope. most people take the standard route of PR. They hire an agency or somebody. They reach out to bloggers. They reach out to the Spotify curators. They reach out to SoundCloud repos, whatever it may be. But they're not reaching out to influencers. So kind of explain that. Why why did you do that and and how has it been for you? Has it been successful? Has it been not successful? What kind of results have you seen from that? I tend to think of it as who has attention within social media. And for example, although they may be not the most popular people, Jake and Logan Paul definitely have a lot of attention. Um, And so just things like that, which made me think, oh, we should definitely be working with these people because they have a lot more attention. They have a lot more eyes on their content than, say, a YouTube promotion channel, the cliche stuff like that. Um, I apologize if I curse in this podcast. No, cursing is fine. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I started looking at a giant list of influencers. I literally wrote down them all in like a spreadsheet type thing. Um, And I've got about 500 entries in there now. So every single time I do PR, I go through the list, I contact them, I write every single email out individually. I don't do copy and paste because I don't believe in that. Um, <laughs> that must take you a lot of time. But the results are so much better. Yeah. And often they'll end up featuring the track if it's a good fit. For it. So, for example, Tropical House, that goes really well with travel videos. So I beat the Australia, sort of the tropical areas there, um, the Caribbean, Mexico, like travel videos in those types of places are really good for sort of chill house, the chill side of EDM. Whilst more harder stuff, so like Bass House and things like that, that will go really well. Gaming videos, and so I've got lots of gaming. High um, energy stuff. Yep, exactly. And so the way in which it translates into views, as I said earlier in this episode, so they can put it in the, the Spotify link, obviously, in the description of the YouTube video. But also, people often have Shazam open on their phone and running in the background or on their computer. And if a song's playing in the background of a video and it comes up on their screen, chances are they're just going to search for it anyway and add it to their favorite playlist. So you get streams, you get followers, you get likes, and obviously if the content is good enough, chances are they'll hit you up on social media as well. Cool. So just you talking about that came up. I came up with a couple of different questions. Um, So with every genre of music, there's always an audience. So how do you kind of discover that audience? Like you said, tropical house music goes really well with travel videos. Mm -hmm. So what are some other genres? I mean, you you also discussed like bass house music goes really well with the gaming videos. So how how can one kind of test the waters in that? Like how would you start kind of reaching out, kind of getting placements rather than just getting rejections? Of course. Um, So what you do is you look at people, um, the type of music they're already featuring. So for example... If an influencer is featuring a lot of tropical house music, chances are they ain't going to feature your bass house music. Like You just got to use common sense. And what you do is you go to probably their Facebook page or a website if they have one and find their email address. And you hit them up and you say, hey, influencer name, my name is whatever. I have X amount of views. I would love to give you this new song which we recently made to use in your YouTube videos. We won't give you copyright strikes, claims, or any of that shit. Um, And I've attached a private download link. I look forward to hearing from you. And that's literally the pitch. And because they get so many pitches which are similar, chances are that they may reply or they may not, but if it's personalized by their name and things like that, chances are they're going to think, oh yeah, they've took some time to put in the effort to send this to me, so I'm going to take some time and actually reply to them if I like it or not. And although they may not like the music, they may ask to send uh, for you to send future music and things like that. And you just got to build a relationship, to be honest, because that's the best way to go into things every single time. Uh, absolutely, and the music industry is absolutely about relationships you're going to get a lot farther in the industry if you're building relationships. Like, 
like for example, Matt and I were talking about on Sunday. His he's he's got some pretty significant meetings coming up. Yeah, I can't obviously reveal the names quite okay. yet. Quite yet. I mean, <laughs> he's told me what they are, but we're not going to reveal them quite yet. And by the time this podcast is live, yeah. you will have published it. But at the time of the showing, we won't be saying anything. Um, so also kind of going off of the different audiences and tropical house music fitting with travel videos. How does the time of year factor into that? Does it factor into that? Like, for example, northern United States, Canada is obviously going to be colder in the winter months. Mm -hmm. So traveling to those locations might not, tropical house music might not fit snowy winters. So how does the time of year kind of factor into that? What you've got to remember is the seasons in the summer, southern hemisphere are totally flipped. Um, for example, in Australia, at Christmas is really hot. And so if, at Christmas, I'll just focus all my promotion on, for example, tropical house travel videos on the Southern Hemisphere because it's still warm, people in that area are still looking for that type of music. And I think you just got to factor it by your demographic. For example, if you do have a large following in the United States, uh, create your content around that. So, for example, you could do winter sports videos with GoPro and stuff like that. If it's a high energy video, you just got to be creative around the topics and the ideas that you have alongside your music to have an effective strategy. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's we're flipped. It's you know. So if it's if it's the winter time in the in the northern hemisphere, then you just focus on the southern hemisphere. Um, so kind of going into the segue is that that kind of comes into like public relations. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of go about? all of that stuff like what are some a couple things that you should take into account before you start reaching out to those different people what are some things you should have in line do you have a, a folder of tracks lined up ready to pitch how do you kind of go about the strategy to reaching out to these people as i said earlier so i have a database or a spreadsheet whatever you want to call it of influences within different genres it's filtered by their location so their country um, the type of videos they make, so travel, gaming, whatever. And so every single time I get sent a track, obviously I get paid for it. Um, I just go through and select the uh, influences that it would suit. Um, often it's probably 100 to 200 influences, I'd say, per track. And admittedly, sometimes it doesn't get featured at all, and that's just how it is. Um, but likewise, in some other cases, we've had really successful results. So I think it's just a balance of the two. Like you've got to go into it knowing that you're going to get rejected. You've got to have the mindset of that. But you've also got to have the mindset of, right, we've got to email as many people as possible because the more people we email, the more chances we'll get of it being featured. And that's just how you got to think of it. True. And, and we had a discussion on Facebook comments the other day that was... Pretty true. There's a lot of people go into public relations thinking that it's their their segue into the industry, mm -hmm. into international stardom. And I mean, it can be. It can be absolutely if you connect with the right person, yeah. but more often than not, it's that's not the case because international stardom is just not an overnight success. It's mm -hmm. not easy to accomplish. But, um, yeah. So when it comes to PR, there's all kinds of facets of PR, and one of yeah. them is playlists. And we yeah. both kind of had experience with with playlists. You more than me, obviously. But so how how can playlists influence ones, whether it be streams, whether it be influence on the industry, yeah. whether it be within their uh, respective genres, et cetera, et cetera. Can I discuss a little bit about that? Okay, so when you pitch to Spotify, there are forms which you fill out, or you can just pitch directly to the curators, whichever they prefer. Often they'll have it on their website. And basically the way in which Spotify streams work is that if a playlist has a lot of followers, a lot of people will listen to it. So if you get into an EDM playlist with a lot of followers, a lot of EDM fans will listen to it, they'll save it, so they'll listen again. And if you just get into more and more playlists, so for example, 10 million reach, chances are you'll easily get a million streams if people like it, if the song is good. And you've literally just got to hit up every single playlist within your niche, ask them uh, to feature your music, often in exchange for something, so... More common than not, it's money or social media shout-outs, whatever. And yeah, literally just 
go heal up as many as you can within your niche because if you actually talk to as many as possible and network with as many as possible, chances are they'll feature it if you have a good relationship with them. Another facet in in of PR is is blogs, and I know you've we've kind of discussed about this before. You've talked about it quite a bit, and a lot of people are kind of um, discussing it as well. Is blogs don't have as much value as they used to. I'd say the value is different to what it was used to. True, I, I would agree with that. Um, certain blogs are worth more than others, and sometimes it's it it really it's really kind of a hit or miss thing. Um, so kind of talk a little bit about how, why you have that opinion versus blogs are worthless versus blogs are everything. Kind of discuss that. I wouldn't say they're worthless and I wouldn't say they're everything. I say right at the moment they're slap bang in the middle almost. Uh, simply being because the media within the typical landscape of journalism, entertainment, whatever you want to call it, it controls people's opinions, it influences people's opinions. And so if you're working on an EDM blog, if you get featured by an EDM blog or whatever genre you're in, uh, people will be influenced by the fact that you've appeared on that blog. So for example, you can use it as leverage to go and get shows in certain countries, certain places, and that's what it's used for now most of the time. Often it's, it won't give you traffic, like I'm just being straight up honest. If you think it'll give you a lot of traffic, it won't, even if it's billboard. Um, and so instead, a lot of people will just, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, they'll basically just use it as leverage. So for example, for a show, for a, a booking agent, or to get a manager, because it shows that people have an interest in your music. People like it, they want to write about it. And so it's sort of a proof of concept that your music is good enough to take it further. And so when you when you say leverage, you're saying it's basically a running resume of yes. say you're going to a promoter and you're saying, hey, I've been featured on Billboard, I've been featured mm-hmm. on EDM.com. So then it shows, it shows the, that the target market, the consumers like the product essentially. Exactly. And I think that's that's good. Um, but there's also a lot of other things that factor in. Like you can't just get featured on three big blogs and think you're going to get booked across the country. Mm-hmm. It's not that easy, unfortunately. It'd be um, nice if it was. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it would make our lives a lot easier. It surely would. Um, so another thing you've been doing, you talked a little bit about this, is is your management. How have you kind of factored all of your playlist skills, your blogging skills, your marketing skills? How have you kind of factored that into your artists and grown them? Um, so at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm trying to create a self-sustaining music industry machine so I don't have to release without labels or anything like that. So, for example, with EDM.com, I'm creating a network of bloggers across like Your EDM, Ear Milk, uh, EDM Chicago, Dancing Astronaut, all of them. So when the time comes that my artist starts releasing music once every two weeks, I'll have the contacts to go, right, here's the song, write about it. Not literally, but... <laughs> um, and then also the playlisting, like, it's pretty obvious that if I've got good playlist contacts, I can get them into more playlists. So, for example, the official ones at Spotify, a lot of EDM ones. Uh, he's also going into rap and pop over the next few months. So I'm trying to create uh, networks within those genres as well. And obviously, when it gets featured in more playlists, he's going to get more money, we're going to get more streams, and that money will be mostly reinvested back into his career. And so, yeah, like I'm just trying to create a good uh, self-sustaining model with the music industry and then just apply it to my artists and literally just loop them into the machine and help them grow. And we'll come to labels in, in a little bit. But So have you you've realized that getting published as much as blogs are kind of right up the middle of being their everything versus their worthless kind of right in the middle there is a happy medium there. The relationship you have with the bloggers greatly influences the success you have with articles, correct? 100%. And (laughs) so if you're, for example, I'm more apt if Matt were to send me a song and he wanted me to write it for whatever publication. Mm-hmm. Being that I have a relationship with Matt and we've talked, we've now met in person, I can trust his his judgment on good music mm-hmm. and vice versa. We, I'm more apt to write about it than somebody who's hitting me up. Randomly on the randomly email. Randomly yeah. via email. Because and, you have a relationship with them, you trust them. 
And quite often, you're just happy to help a friend out, and that's how it is within the music industry. Exactly, and not only that, a lot of the publisher, a publicist, they tend to attack my personal emails, oh, and yeah, I don't I like that. that. Mm-hmm. I strongly advise against that. Um, but for the most part, if if Matt were to hit me up with a song and vice versa, you know, he's more apt to write about it. I'm more apt to write about yeah. his because I can trust his judgment in in music. Um, so now let's kind of move into labels. You said that you yeah. wanted to start talking, you wanted to create a self-running machine. Starting a movement. <laughs> Starting a movement. <laughs> it all starts with a movement. It really does. Um, and we've I've really noticed a trend over the last five to ten years, even that labels are kind of becoming not as important. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd certainly say they're less relevant. They're less relevant. They're still important mm. because sometimes they have bigger marketing budgets and they have big artists. Big artists. Drake. And of course, <laughs> exactly, of course you have you have the three big labels. You have Sony Music, you have Universal Music Group and, and Warner. So and within those there's subsidiaries within subsidiaries. There's loads of subsidiaries. And there's so if you can definitely get signed to Warner Music Group, you're obviously going to have a huge marketing mm. budget. You're going to have a massive database of contacts. Oh, yeah. So, and you're going to have people who know exactly who to talk to. Um, But labels are not as big as they used to be. They are, everybody tends to start their own label and just release through it because it's very independent these days. Kind of, can you talk a little bit about why they're becoming more independent and versus why you would rather have an independent versus signing a 10-year contract or whatever? Uh, first of all, information is now commoditized. Like 10 years ago, the major labels, so Sony, Warner, Universal, they used to have all the information on how to be successful in the music industry. But now that the internet is a lot more progressed than what it was back then, you literally just got to type into Google how to get a million plays on Spotify and it'll tell you a rough result or you can just get my articles, whichever you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so first of all, information is becoming more commoditized. So you can just literally get information on how to do something and if you've got the right contacts, the right strategy, you can do it, no problem. But also, a lot of labels take 50, 60, 80%, whatever. And what's the point? Like... I've had a lot of labels which we've released within the past and they've done literally nothing on the marketing side at all and they've taken 60% of the royalties and it's like, why? And so by releasing independently, first of all, you have a lot more control as to how you release, when you release, the artwork, the strategy behind the song. You also get 100% of the royalties unless you collaborate with other artists, of course, or whatever deals you have in place. But when you sign a 10-year contract with, I don't know, Universal, you're pretty uh, restricted as to what you can do within the music industry because they're going to say, right, we want you to release three times a year. You're going to have this brand image. You're going to have this, this, and this, and this. And it doesn't become your career, your vision anymore. Instead, it becomes somebody else's using you as a vehicle to get more money, more profit, whatever. And... That's fine for some people, like, I accept that, and if that's what they want, then so be it, good for you. But personally, I just like the vision of being able to control my destiny, my future, my career, and certainly my artist's career, and that's why I'm putting it on the record that I won't sign him to a major record label, certainly not in the way which they are right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I follow a guy, his name is Ari Herstand, I don't know if you've heard of him. He He's a song singer-songwriter, and he's written a book that I just finished reading, um, How to Make It in the New Music Business. Mm-hmm. Great book, by the way, if you'd like to um, read it. Um, but he talks about, on his Twitter and in his book, and how a major record label is not the gateway. Mm-hmm. It, can be, it can be really good, or it can be the demise of your career. I know people have been signed to a major record label, <coughs> major record label, they've had like a five-year, ten-year contract, and they regret it instantly. And it's just because they're so restricted, like you had mentioned, they literally have to release three times a year, they have this image, they're going to be touring these, these countries, they're going to be meeting these people, they're going to be interviewing with these media companies, et cetera, et cetera, and they literally have no control over their careers. Exactly. Like I've spoken to a lot of artists uh, quite high up, so for example, some big pop singers, and often they'll get 
uh, request to collaborate with people within other genres, so for example, country, rap, whatever, and they would love to do it because they think, oh yeah, this would be good for my music career, but the major record label would just say, no, you're not doing that, and so that just gets wiped off the agenda completely, and I think that's quite sad. So you have really kind of grown yourself within the music industry. You've been very successful and you have That's some, nice <laughs> some... You have. You, it's very inspiring to see what you've done and the people that are listening. And it's, it's good to see a fellow friend and, and music industry professional kind of growing. Um, so how have you set up these big meetings that you have that forthcoming... How have you kind of met with these these networking? Networking. <laughs> so I graduated from Full Sail, and that is their number one thing is they, yep. they thrive on networking. Any entertainment industry, yep. you have to, have to, have to network. Oh yeah, definitely. So why is networking so important? Why? First of all, you meet so many people. Like when I was in New York. I met someone, they introduced me to more people, they introduced me to more people, and just within the seven days I was in New York, I met a lot of people within the music industry. I got invited to Trump Tower to have a meeting there, that was pretty awesome, and you just get to meet so many people, like you never know who you're going to meet, who they might be friends with. Um, For example, now I'm pretty close with a lot of big managers, big artists even, And just the fact that it allows you to expand your career for future opportunities, whether it's collaborations, remixes, free tickets to a show. (laughs) Um, Like, there's just so many opportunities available. And if you network, if you actually talk to people, because people have social media, but they're not being social on it. And so by networking, it just allows you to actually explore the industry you're in. I recently got into, like, trying to do more Twitter networking because a lot of musicians are on Twitter and they're also being hit up less there as well so they got more chances of reading your DMs yeah absolutely um, but I mean just through networking Matt has met with many people I've met I've met and got to network with artists like Blau I got to interview EDX I've had to interview uh, Yuki Party I'm pretty close with Dimitri Vegas and like Mike now so Yuki yeah I've got to I just recently interviewed um, Borgor um, it, it, it's networking is just so vital. And if you, you connect with the right people and one thing that I have found to be successful is if you're looking to get more so like find out who Dimitri, like, like Dimitri Vegas and like Mike, it's such a mouthful, Dimitri Vegas and like Mike, who their management are, who their PR agency is. It's literally as easy as going that on. That management are one of the guys which run Tomorrowland, so that's a useful contact yeah, for me. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, it, it's for me, I've, I've found success just going on LinkedIn. And, you know, for example, if I want to work at Red Light Management, I'm searching Red Light Management in there. Finding all the people who work who there, work there, hit them up. What, reading, clicking on their profile, saying artist manager at Red Light Management. Yep. What artists are they managing? Okay, find them on Facebook. Yeah, you find them on exactly, Twitter. Exactly, exactly. I con- love this theory. Start a conversation. And I found a lot of success through doing that. I've had interviews with jobs which haven't really gone anywhere. They have just haven't been a fit for me. They weren't they didn't end up to be what I thought they were. But just having that connection saying, "Hey, my name is Lennon. Here's what I'm doing." It, it means a lot. Also with Facebook, literally now, I think I actually only discovered this feature about two months ago, but you can literally search people who work at Red Light Management, people who work at Monster Cat, people who work at Sony Music, and what you do is you go to people and you just literally scroll down, look who has mutual friends, add them up, they accept, and then you message them saying, hey. What's up? You know, taking that extra step and showing that you're willing to make an effort to set up a meeting, to set up a phone call, to have lunch, buy them a coffee, whatever. It, it speaks volumes upon everybody else who's just, who's just attacking their email. And another thing is, is recently is Billboard or Forbes or whoever are sharing the top 30 women who are very involved in the music industry. Go on their LinkedIn's, meet up with them, find them, see what they're doing, compliment them on something. If they wrote an article, if they wrote a book, mention something about it. You know, Hit them up on Facebook. Start a conversation on Twitter. Compliment them. Trust me, it works. Like when people compliment me on my articles, they then ask me for something. 
they go to love one child. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm the same way. If if you're gonna compliment me, at, whether it be your hair looks really good today, or I really like the article you wrote, it's like I'm gonna give you more time a day than the person next to you. Is this a like, hey feature my song? Yeah, hey feature my song. Well, what am I gonna get in return? Not even tickets or a free T-shirt or something. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to talk about Scooter Braun for a minute, just because sure. he's my inspiration, so that's cool. <laughs> it gives you a chance to think of something. Sure. Um, so Scooter Braun, he is the manager of Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, Martin Garrix, and so many more. I think he's still managing Usher. Um, and he was the manager of Kenya West. And his motto is to inspire the world to try. And I just think that's pretty damn awesome, to be totally honest with you. I love you. that. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, you don't you don't know what's going to happen if you don't try something. Like, if you've got an ambition, just go for it. If you want to be a dancer, go for it. If you want to be a singer, just try. Because at the end of the day, like, you want to make your actions have an impact on the world. He said in a podcast, actually, pretty recently, I think it was with Lewis Howes on the School of Greatness, that in 100 years, people won't remember his name, but he really hopes that they remember his impact. I just think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, Scooter is one of my favorite people as well. He's a very talented guy. Um, and his management roster is pretty great as well. I mean, he's managed somebody or everybody that everybody's heard of. Yeah. So it's like he's definitely credible. He's a very talented guy. I, mean, I just hope that one day I can be like him or almost as successful as him. Um, and if he's listening... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi, Scooter. Um, and that was, I, I, I can certainly agree with, with that as well, as a lot of the opportunities that I've had or have, have come on and, and ready to my, to my plate, I guess, mm-hmm. is because I've tried something. Yeah. And it's so important to at least try something rather than sitting back and going, because, man, I wish I would have done that. Literally, like, even yesterday... I was finding collaborations for my artist anecdote because obviously we're going out of EDM now, we're going into a totally new scene. And so it's like, oh, that rapper won't reply to me. But then I just think, oh, wait, what if they do? So I hit them up and then two hours later I get a reply saying yes and it's like, oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, but you don't know until you try. Exactly. That's, That's the whole thing is... Exactly. Taking an opportunity that you may think that it's not going to go through, it it might. And it, it, you won't know until you try. And the the worst thing that they can do is say no. Exactly. Like they won't have anything personal against you if they say no. It's just more often than not they've got a busy schedule. You know, busy schedule, or it just doesn't fit this time around, or it can be a multitude of things. Exactly. Um, often they may not reply, and again, just don't take it personally. Like chances are that they get thousands of emails a day. You just got to take it on the chin and move on. And in the music industry, you're going to get more denials than you are acceptance. Oh. So you just have to learn to not take denial personally or rejectance personally um, and just kind of move on and learn from it. Definitely. I totally agree with you. So you, you, talked, about, you talked about creating a self-containing music industry machine. So with that, once it starts taking off, what, what are your visions for the future? Well, my plan is to create a similar roster to what Scooter Braun has, but not probably not as large. But my aim is to have like a several influencers with a couple million followers, so that they're able to promote the tracks within my music roster, and also my music roster can provide them with music, so they don't have to worry about copyright or anything like that. Um, but also, like I want to start as Drake said, start from the bottom. Um, so with Anecdote, I'm trying to build him up to be the next Diplo or Skrillex. So I want to take on a vocalist at some point and I want to take on a rapper. Because at the end of the day, if I can build them up into the next Eminem, the next Bieber, whatever, and then they start featuring on each other's tracks, it's going to get real big. Yeah. And that's my vision, basically. And I just want to feed them through the machine, grow them, grow their brand, and hopefully make them into superstars. And so I know you're, you've talked about your, your tactical approach to using social media marketers. What other tactics do you have to grow? Because you say you want to grow them, and you don't have to get specific because you don't want to you know, trade secrets. But 
what kind of tactics are you going to use? Will you continue using the tactics you're using now, or will you kind of evolve them and change over time? I mean, at the moment, we're actually looking to penetrate other markets. So, as an example, Justin Bieber. I wrote this in the article last night. He went into the Latin market by working with some of the biggest names in Latin music, uh, Luis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee. They made Esposito, it hits a billion streams, it's probably more than that now, and they did really well. So what we're doing is we're looking at the Asian market, because that's somewhere Anecdote has a large following. Uh, we've got a stadium show in South Korea actually later this year, and we're looking at working with some really big names within K-pop. And the aim is to get his name as like the producer from the UK who came over to South Korea, Asia, China, wherever. I mean, I know China's in Asia, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And basically became a superstar there. And our hope is to do that all over the world. So we'll be looking at who's big in Australia, who's big in Chile, who's big in Argentina, Canada. Uh, South Africa. Africa's actually a place I want to explore a little bit more. Um, but yeah, like we just want to get him everywhere around the world very, very strategically. Yeah, I I think that's... And that com- comes back to um, finding your kind of niche in music. Well, your niche might be travel, but there's travel all over the world. Why do you think I'm traveling the US now? I'm meeting people and establishing connections and strengthening them. You traveled in Canada, you're in... You lived in Australia, you're from the UK, so you kind of have a little bit of understanding of of multiple cultures. Yeah, I understand the different demographics. People in Australia are wired differently to people in the US, for example. Earlier in the podcast, we talked about kind of releasing music, marketing it, finding your niche audience, and getting it to the right people. So what is the strategy behind that in releasing a song? What kind of comes up to that point? I might as well just go through the entire strategy right now then. Sure. Um, so first of all, we're going to start releasing tracks via TuneCore or RootNote, um, their distribution platforms. The reason for that is it costs $9.99 per year for each song. So obviously if you're making several thousand dollars a song, it's a no-brainer. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing we do in order to sort of maximize the amount of profits because that would be one of the small expenses that we'd incur whilst releasing a track instead of obviously going via a major label or whatever. Next, we're working with influencers. As I said, we're working with big rappers, big influencers, vocalists, things like that. So what we're going to get them to do is we're going to get them to do swipe up videos on Instagram, Snapchat, and other social platforms. So they'll go... Hey, my name is De, and I did, recently did a track with Anecdote. Swipe up to listen to it on Spotify. It links to Spotify. We get that hundreds of thousands of views. It's a no-brainer. We get a decent amount of money from that. Also, obviously, I've got contacts within Spotify, Apple Music, other places, Tidal, like almost anywhere you can think of. And so we're going to be doing official pitching to that. Obviously, it's not guaranteed every track gets accepted, but that's just how it is. Um, And then next, what we're doing is I'm utilizing EDM.com. I have spoken to the editors about this, and they're cool with it. Um, But basically, we're going to get Anecdote to do takeovers to coincide with the release of a track. Uh, so he'll get a decent amount of audience siphoned from EDM.com's website, Facebook, Instagram, to go directly straight to the music. And obviously, if it ends up being a hit single and Anecdote decide to premiere it with EDM.com, then, well, that's good for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what, lastly, for the music strategy, what we're doing is we're getting multiple remixes of the song. So, for example, we're getting a house remix, a rap remix, uh, a tropical house. Because basically that allows us to expand the audience, the reach of the track into so many different genres. It allows us to get into loads of YouTube channels, Spotify playlists, which we wouldn't ordinarily. Because it's going to be like rap music, commercial music, and obviously that wouldn't be featured by Mr. Rebels or Chill Nation or whoever. But say if we get a big... A uh, chill producer to do it, then chances are it will. And um, also blog write up, so EDM.com, EDM Tunes, EDM Chicago, Dancing Astronaut, EDM Source, and just loads and loads more. Um, after that, 
um, we'll look uh, look at the viral charts on YouTube. So, what influence are what influencers are regularly appearing there? And we're going to be reaching out to them, offering content, probably finding a way to trade with them. So, for example, we'll probably offer something in exchange for them featuring the music, just so they get something out of it as well. And then we're going to be using sort of probably 50 to 100 micro influencers, so people who have like 5,000 followers, 10,000, 20,000, whatever, within the audience which we want to target. So, as I said earlier, if it's a gaming, uh, if it's a high energy track, then use gaming influencers and stuff like that. Get them to create Spotify. Uh, swipe up we can pay them for that it's no problem and get them to link to the uh, track on Spotify and also large YouTube uploads with big channels uh, viral videos to promote the track so getting stuff on Unilad the Lab Bible the Wall of Comedy the Hook and so many more because that will drive traffic to his fan pages and obviously if the for example with Instagram if the new song is his link in the website bio and 500,000 people a week are coming to his uh, profile. That's going to be a decent amount of people converting straight to Spotify streams. And also, just sort of create the idea of... <clears throat> the idea of creating a challenge. So we have Black Beatles with a mannequin challenge. Uh, in the UK, there was the barking challenge where there was the chorus and then people rap over a part of the instrumental. And so just things like that, you've got to be creative with your release strategy and just make it reverse engineer the audience so it's interesting to them and it's not just like, hey, listen to my song. You've got to create content which they actually are interested in. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And so obviously the release strategy is not tried and true. It's not going to work every time. Cool. You have to modify it to fit your artist, to fit your target market. Everything it's it's like earlier we discussed in the in the podcast is the music industry is trial and error and you're probably that marketing strategy is going to be much different next month and the year and the month after that and until it starts kind of working and then the music industry is going to do something completely different and you're going to have to rewrite the whole strategy so it, it it's really not tried and true when you talked about in the release strategy and you're talking about the influencers, you're talking about the micro influencers, the people who have yeah. five, 10,000 followers, the, what types of things are you paying them? If they're say they don't want to take payment, what types of things are you trading for them? Are you giving them merch? Are you giving them tickets to a well, show? Like they may want merch. They may want tickets for a show. Like we'll happily give them a lifetime pass to our shows. Like that's not a problem. Because um, obviously I manage the artist, so I can say, look, this person's getting into the show, this is person on the guest list, whatever. And so, yeah, we'll literally just ask them, what do you want in exchange for doing this? And they may ask money, they may ask free stuff. Like, everyone's different. Like, some people don't want money, some people don't want free stuff, and you just got to reverse engineer the person you're asking. So what is the cutoff point for the major influencers and the micro influencers like how many followers are like what do you gauge it just by followers or do you gauge it by engagement i i, I wouldn't even say there's a cutoff point like i just categorize people randomly to be totally honest because yeah. there's people who are absolutely massive within one space who may only have twenty thousand followers on a platform and so but then you wouldn't class them as a micro influencer because they're not and so you've literally just got to look at, right, is this person getting good engagement in comparison to the amount of followers they have? And that's what I tend to look for. So normally above 10% is pretty good. And so if they're able to have that, then I'd consider them worth working with 100%, even if they've only got 1,000 followers. Absolutely. And are there people that you, that strictly, like, for example, I've went to, people's Facebook pages and they have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers and then you go to Instagram and they've only got 6,000. So are there people that you work directly with Facebook, people that you work directly with Instagram, people that you work directly with Snapchat? And do you, does it matter like for this like genre or song release or is it kind of, does the audience kind of cross over into Instagram? Does their audience the yeah. similar? I'd say the audience is very similar. So for example... 
people who like gaming music probably won't be as much into tropical house as they are bass house, just as an example, because they want to listen to music whilst gaming and they want to listen to something high energy. And so they're more likely to listen, work with gaming influencers and stuff like that if it's a bass house producer. And so, yeah, I'd say the crossover is really, really good. It's really strong. And you just got to do a bit of research into your genre, find what works within your niche. That was a lot of information. Definitely. I I hope it was useful. Yes, it was definitely useful to me and I hope to the audience and people listening. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to You're very welcome. I'm glad to be on here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch. Um, How can people keep in touch with you? They can quite honestly add me on Facebook. I don't care. Um, Or they can email me, which is mattlilywhitemgmt at gmail.com. Or they can just hit me up on Instagram, Matt Lily White Projects. Like, Facebook's probably the best way to reach me, though, to be honest. One last question before you go. If there's any one solid piece of advice you could give to somebody just starting in the industry, whether it be a songwriter, whether it be an artist, whether it be a manager, whoever, what piece of advice would you give to them? Don't give up. Like, I've seen people who... Had I thought were going to be absolutely massive and gave up. Like, you don't know that the day you give up, the day after, it could be your big break. And so you just got to keep pursuing your passion. Like, even if people give hate towards you, which they will if you're being successful, you just got to push through it. you got to be strategic. you just got to look, say, hey, you're doing really well so far. Don't give up now. You've come so far and you just got to... Go all in on your passion, go all in your strength, and if you're good enough, you'll achieve your dreams. Thank you so much for listening. All of the names, companies, and products mentioned in this episode will be in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to my email list to receive updates when a new episode is live, as well as music industry tips and tricks. Also, please leave me a five-star review as it greatly helps this podcast be discovered. You can also support me on Patreon. The link is in the show notes below.